Hi everyone, welcome to my video on So Moted B. Freemasonry has been around for many years, but most people don't know what So Moted B really means or what it stands for. In this video we will take a look at some of the meanings of So Moted B and I will share with you what it stands for. I want to welcome you to my channel. I will post videos on various subjects and interests. Feel free to subscribe. You will see that the videos will become much more interesting about Freemasonry. Now let's start. The meaning of so mote it be. What a well-known phrase. No lodge is ever open or closed properly unless it is used. Yet few know how old it is, let alone what deep meaning it contains. It's so close to us that we don't notice it like so many other old and exquisite things. As far back as we can go in the annals of the craft, we find the sold phrase. Its form betrays its sage. The word moat is an Anglo-Saxon word, derived from an anomalous verb, M-O-T-E-N. Chaucer uses the exact phrase in the same sense in which we use it, meaning so may it be. It is found in the Regius Boehm, the oldest document of the craft, just as we use it today. As everyone knows, it is the Masonic form of the ancient Tamen which echoes through the ages, gathering meaning and music as it goes, until it is one of the richest and most haunting of words. Initially only a sign of agreement, either on the part of an individual or an assembly, to words of prayer or praise, it has evolved into a sentinel at the gateway of silence. When we have uttered all that we can utter, and our poor words seem like cripples on the bosom of the unspoken, somehow this familiar phrase gathers up all that has left our dumb yearnings, our deepest longings, and bears them aloft to one who understands. In some strange way, it seems to speak for us into the very ear of God the things for which words were never made. So, naturally, it has a place of honor among us. At the marriage altar, it speaks its blessing as young love walks toward the bliss or sorrow of hidden years. It stands beside the cradle when we dedicate our little ones to the holy life, mingling its benediction with our vows. At the graveside, it utters its sad response to the shadowy amen which death pronounces over our friends. When, in our turn, we see the end of the road and would make a last will and testament, leaving our earnings and savings to those whom we love. The old legal phrase asks us to repeat after it. In the name of God, amen. And with us, as with Gerundius in his dream, the last word we hear when the voices of the earth grow faint and the silence of God covers us, is the old amen, so mote it be. It resounds so powerfully throughout the book of holy law, we hear it in the Psalms, as chorus answers chorus, where it is sometimes reduplicated for emphasis. It has a striking use in Jesus' conversations with his friends, which is hidden in the English version. The oft-repeated phrase, Verily, verily I say unto you, if rightly translated, means, Amen, Amen, I say unto you. Later, in the epistles of Paul, the word Amen becomes the name of Christ, who is the Amen of God to the faith of man. So, too, in the lodge, at opening, at closing, and in the hour of initiation, no mason ever enters upon any great or important undertaking without invoking the aid of the deity. And he ends his prayer with the old phrase, So mote it be, which is another way of saying, the will of God be done, or whatever be the answer of God to his prayer. So be it because it is wise and right. What, then, is the meaning of this sold phrase, so interwoven with all our Masonic lore, simple, tender, haunting? It has two meanings for us everywhere, in the church or in the lodge. First, it is the ascent of man to the way and will of God, ascent to his commands. Ascent to his providence, even when a tender, terrible stroke of death takes from us one much love and leaves us forlorn. Still, somehow, we must say, 
So it is. So be it. He is a wise man, a brave man, who, baffled by the woes of life, when disaster follows fast and follows faster, can nevertheless accept his lot as a part of the will of God and say, though it may almost choke him to say it, so mote it be, it is a wise reconciliation to the will of the Eternal, not blind submission or dumb resignation. The other meaning of the phrase is even more wonderful. It is the ascent of God to the aspiration of man. A man can bear so much anything. Perhaps if he feels that God knows, cares, and feels for him and with him. If God says amen, so it is to our faith and hope and love. It links our perplexed meanings and helps us to see, however dimly or in a glass darkly, that there is a wise and good purpose in life, despite its sorrow and suffering, and that we are not at the mercy of fate or the whim of chance. Does God speak to man? confirming his faith and hope. If so, how? Indeed, yes. God is not the great I was, but the great I am. And he is neither deaf nor deafeningly silent. We live, move, and have our being in him. He speaks to us through nature, moral law, and our hearts, if we have ears to hear. But he speaks most clearly in the book of holy law, which lies open on our altar. Neither is that all. Some of us believe that the Word of God became flesh and dwelt among us, full of grace and truth, in a life the loveliest ever lived among men, showing us what life is, what it means, and to what fine issues it ascends when we do God's will on earth as it is done in heaven. No one of us grows wistful when he thinks of Jesus' life, however far we fall below it. Today, Men are asking the question, does it do any good to pray? The man who actually prays does not ask such a question. We ask if it does a bird any good to sing, or a flower to bloom. Prayer is natural and instinctive in man. We are created in this way. Man is made for prayer, as sparks ascend to seek the sun. He would not need religious faith if the objects of it did not exist. Are prayers ever answered? Yes. Always, as Emerson taught us long ago, he who rises from prayer a better man, his prayer is answered and that is as far as we need to go. The deepest desire, the ruling motive of a man, is his actual prayer, and it shapes his life after its form and color. In this sense, all prayer is answered, and that is why we ought to be careful what we pray for because in the end, we always get it. What, then, is the good of prayer. It makes us reflect on the unknown with hope. It makes us ready for life. It is a recognition of laws and the threat of our conjunction with them. It is not the purpose of prayer to beg or make God do what we want done. Its purpose is to bring us to do the will of God, which is greater and wiser than our will. It is not to use God, but to be used by Him in the service of His plan. Can man by prayer change the will of God? No, and yes. True prayer does not wish or seek to change the larger will of God, which involves in its sweep and scope the duty and destiny of humanity. But it can and does change the will of God concerning us because it changes our will and attitude towards Him, which is the vital thing in prayer for us. For example, if a man is living a wicked life, we know what the will of God will be for him. All evil ways have been tried. And we know what the end is, just as we know the answer to a problem in geometry. But if a man who is living wickedly changes his way of living and his inner attitude, he changes the will of God if not his will, at least his intention. That is, he obtains what even the divine will could not give or do for him unless it was accomplished through his will and prayer. The place of prayer in masonry is not perfunctory. It is not a mere matter of form and rote. It is vital and profound. As a man enters the lodge as an initiate, prayer is offered for him to God, in whom he puts his trust. Later, in the course of his initiation, he must pray for himself, either orally or mentally, as his heart desires. It is not just a ceremony. 
it is basic to the faith and spirit of masonry. Still later, in a scene which no mason ever forgets, when the shadow is darkest, and the most precious thing a mason can desire or seek seems lost, in the perplexity and despair of the lodge, a prayer is offered, as recorded in our monitors. It is a mosaic of Bible words, in which the grim facts of life and death are set forth in stark reality, and an appeal is made to the pity and light of God. It is truly a great prayer to join in, which is to place ourselves in the very hands of God, as all must do in the end, trusting in His will and way, following where no path is into the soft and fascinating darkness which men call death and the response of the lodge to that prayer, as to all others offered at its altar, is the old, challenging phrase, so mote it be, Brother, do not be ashamed to pray, as you are taught in the lodge and the church. It is a part of the sweetness and sanity of life, refreshing the soul and making clear the mind. There is more wisdom in a whispered prayer than in all the libraries in the world. It is not our business to instruct God. He knows what things we need before we ask Him. He does not need our prayers, but we do if only to make us acquainted with the best friend we have. The greatest of all teachers of the soul left us a little liturgy called the Lord's Prayer. He told us to keep it in the closet when the door was closed in the den, hum, and litter of the world was outside. Try it, brother. It will sweeten life make its load lighter, its joy brighter, and the way of duty plainer. One was written by a great saint, and the other by two brothers. Grant me, Lord, ardent desire, wise study, right understanding, and perfect fulfillment of that which pleased thee. And the second is after the manner. May two brothers enjoy and serve thee together, and so life today that we may be worthy to live tomorrow. So mote it be. I hope that you enjoyed watching this video. Thank you very much for watching. I hope that you enjoy the content. If you have any questions, please ask in the comments section below. Please subscribe and share your thoughts.